I want to just start with Palantir. Founded out of 9-11, you've won business from the pandemic. You've won business from the war in Ukraine. Does Palantir need chaos to thrive and grow? Does it need that kind of environment? Look, um, we build products that, that shine under war conditions. So the more businesses experience turbulence, the more the world experiences pandemics and unfortunately war, the more the tools you need actually have to work. Our competition is jargon, PowerPoints, fraudulent products, and these products just disappear when you have economic crisis, right. you have a pandemic, you have a war, and the stuff we've been building over 20 years uh, shines. And you see this, you saw this in the counterterrorism context, you saw it in the uh, pandemic context, as discussed here. Well, a lot of that, though, is public sector, isn't it? Government. I think what's interesting about FoundryCon while we're here is a lot of those in attendance, the deals you announced, they're actually private sector. Yeah. Well, it, our theory, and it's being proven, is exactly the same thing happens in the commercial sector. So if you're, you have all these data architecture, which is basically 50 products that are churning your data, pleasuring your org, but providing no real alpha, when times get bad, your supply chain gets broken, you have to deal with a different kind of workforce, you are, you are drilling for oil under regulatory conditions that you find to be new and harsh, you have to track emissions, you have to rebuild your supply chain. The old products just don't work. One of the pieces of news is Sompo expanding its relationship with you, a $50 million extension, but it's already a client. My question is, how reliant is Palantir on the private sector right now, on the kind of an existing cluster of clients growing what they well, do with you depends. rather than new customers? Uh, well, we like both. You know, we really like the older customers because we've shown it's worked and we can say, look, we're creating a billion in value. We obviously should, you should expand our software uh, offering. Um, we like new customers. I mean, the unvarnished version is Palantir is growing like a weed in the US, which is adaptive and embraces new technologies and we are embracing that. Can I ask you a mechanical question? Yeah. Your target rate for 30% annual growth by 2025, mechanical question, but it, the new deals you're announcing today, evidence that you're on track Look, for that. I, my, my lawyers literally shoot me if I answer questions like that, but if you look at what's going on in the world, radical disruption, our products are succeeding, and the US market, part of the reason I can't answer that question is you'd have to say well, how we did Q4. Our U.S. market growth is really impressive. I want to go back to something you were talking about on stage, where you've been active, the war in Ukraine being one example, but also healthcare. And when you sit down yourself, because I know you've done a lot of the deals with public sector in the past 20 years, but also private sector, how do you get across that data competency is an advantage in warfare, in espionage, well, or in really, healthcare? It really depends. In the Ukrainian context, they had talked to the most important clandestine service and military in the world. They unanimously recommended Palantir, and they're very technical. So that's, then you have newer clients. At this stage, I, my basic thing I tell clients, partners, is like, look, everyone will tell you the same stuff. It all looks the same. Why don't you just see our stuff in action or talk to people who've used the software? You know, if you're gonna buy the software off of PowerPoint, don't buy us. You wanna talk to someone who's used our software, you'll buy us. I know you're proud of your engineering team. You lead engineering, right? But you've also done a lot on the sales side. I noticed that when you've grown the sales team, it's been more on the private sector focus. Is that strategy working for you? It's definitely working in the US. And elsewhere? And then and elsewhere, we're, we're, we're at the beginning. Look, we, we didn't have salespeople until a couple of years ago. So a lot of this is figuring out how we can do this. I think we've kind of gotten pretty close to cracking the nut in the US, and then we have to expand it outside the US. You like working with the government, the US government. Well, I'm proud to work with the US government. But you don't sell to China or operate in China or with Chinese companies. Is that a sort of corporate patriotism, or, or is there well, no demand there for you? Well, we, for 20 years, when it was popular and investors thought it was crucial to work in China, we've said the same thing. There's no distinction between public and private entities there. Our products are actually also weapons of war, and we're not going to sell them directly or indirectly to adversaries. 
this made us enormously controversial in Silicon Valley and still makes us controversial in Silicon Valley. And quite frankly, it's one of the decisions I'm most proud of. We are a company whose most important purpose is to power the West to, to even higher heights in the commercial and in the government context. And we've done this in anti-terror, in the context of the pandemic, in the context of war, in the context of data protection. And you really can't do that if you're going to also transfer those technologies indirectly or directly to your adversaries, and we've never done it. You were talking on stage about how you're a public company and you have a responsibility to your shareholders, and at times in the last 20 years, shareholders have complained to you, like, why are you doing this? It's loss-making, or why are you not doing that? And we talked about your strategy. Investors haven't really cheered it if you purely go off the share price performance. What is your message to them today about well, the deals yeah, we announced and, and that? So, we are a company that has a primary mission. The primary mission is to make the West stronger and better. That mission has secondarily led to 61% CAGR over 20 years, 35% CAGR in the US government. And the share price is, thing is, I think, a little bit of a red herring because all tech is down. I don't think our shares have been any more punished than anyone else's. So if you are an investor and you want to go long on transforming our country and our allies, you have a home at Palantir. I have never, ever, ever wavered from that statement. And if you don't want to invest in us, because of that, you should. And if you're investing in us thinking I'm going to change, you're making a mistake. You, you, we lay our cards on the table. There is nothing besides transparency here. We have a, when we went to the Ukraine, I didn't ask them, can you pay us? I said, here's the product. If I had gone to Standard Investor, they'd be like, well, you can't do this until they pay you. When we started off in America on the pandemic and in Britain, we said, look, we can help. This is the primary mission of our company. And I think where I'm very aligned with investors is they're hearing the truth. I'm not saying, hey, we might change this policy. We might do crazy deals in adversarial countries. We might put the other missions ahead of our point. No, and by the way, I tell the most important investors that every day, Palantirians, and I tell our retail investors, whom I revere, that every time I go on TV, in you spirit, know what you're buying when you buy Palantir. In the spirit of transparency, okay. you, you yourself have sold stock regularly since the lockup expiry in 2021. Um, in the full, in the fairness of full transparency, in the last year or so, I've only sold for tax reasons. There's been no financial okay. sales. I'm grateful to be here with you in Palo Alto. I'm surprised to be here with you in Palo Alto. You, you've talked about monoculture in Silicon Valley. You moved the company to Colorado and you've not come back often in the last three years. Because Silicon Valley has obviously failed in its mission to produce technology that's useful and that, the, useful for the world and makes it a better place. And we were, I think, the first reasonably large company to leave. And now I'm very happy to come back and say, look, you know, on occasion, you know, our position is a position we're proud of and be surrounded again by people who disagree with me. There are many woke engineers, I think those are words you've used, that have lost their jobs recently at some tech giants. I know that you're looking at growth. Are you open to hiring those engineers? Do not join Palantir if you are not willing to support the US military and its allies. You can have, by the way, any political opinion you want as long as that's not a question for you. If it is a question for you, do not, Palantir is not your home. I want to ask you about the long term because you're very involved in this company. On stage, you're explaining the role that you take leading engineering as well. You have this class or share structure class along with Peter Thiel. Long term, do you expect to stay as the CEO, a founding CEO? What is your kind of succession plan? Have you heard rumors? No, no I'm no, just curious. No, I'm I never get to you. talk to you. Yeah. So no, I'm no, trying no, to no, I'm catch I'm teasing up. You. Look, I'm very happy what I'm doing uh, and what I'm doing. I think I'm sitting on one of the most important levers for good in the world, and I don't plan to leave that position. And what's the long-term plan for Palantir? Talk to me about the next 10 years, because you've well, done 20. The, the government, our governments are spending less than 1% on things that scare Russia and China. I want that to change to like 5%, and Palantir will obviously be a large portion of that. And then on the commercial side, look, making sure an industry that's dynamic wins right. is something we're passionate about. So we're going to grow and build and build. You know, over 20 years, we've built four, arguably five of the most important software products in the world. 
over the next 20 years, we'll build four or five of the most significant software products in the world. We're going to grow our uh, presence all over. We're going to stay small and nimble, you know, so we are hiring, but uh, we're not like a body shop. We're just going to continue, keep our culture vibrant, build on our culture, build on our employments, and show the world that, you know, the West is strong.